to welcome everyone who is in here personally, uh, and also the people who are joining us in digital land. Um, we're here to... Uh, thank you very much for that. We're here for the Reimagining the Nordic Living Environment uh, side event uh, in this new Bauhaus uh, Forum and Festival. Uh, this uh, event is organized in conjunction with the Nordic Networks of Circular Construction, uh, funded by the uh, Nordic Council of Ministers. Um, my name is Vincent Passal. I will be the moderator for uh, this morning and your host, and I'm very happy uh, that you all could join and to be here. I work for Demos Helsinki, which is a Finnish impact tank, uh, though my name is definitely not Finnish, but I will be challenged with some of those a little later on. Um, we have a really exciting, actually, um, morning for you uh, with a keynote, uh, two very interesting panels. Uh, so I hope that you will say the entire time, enjoy, and in particular, join in with your questions. Uh, we want this to be pretty informal, and we would love to have a conversation much more than something quite structured and uh, defined. So without any ado, um, we will have actually a little greeting word, not in person, but through the magic of technology, uh, from Rita Kasvo, um, Kaivosoya, sorry, who is the Director General of the Finnish Ministry of Education and Art. And the magic of technology. <laughs> Dear guests, warm welcome, both in Brussels and online. It's my pleasure to open today's discussions. To me, the title of today's session, Reimagining Nordic Living Environments, is hopeful. We all know that these times of climate change call for rapid action from all of society. The solutions needed will fundamentally affect our ways of life. Sometimes it can be easy to forget that these changes can not only lead to something new, but something better as well. Today we will discuss the role of culture and especially architecture on the path to a more sustainable future. The discussions are a part of a Nordic cooperation project called Nordic Networks for Circular Construction. In this project, Nordic partners are searching for ways to accelerate circular economy in the construction sector. The Ministry of Education and Culture Finland is a proud member of this project. The project partners believe that a cultural approach is needed to support the shift towards circularity. This event will feed into the development of a Nordic narrative for Baukultur, which is a part of the project. I hope that this narrative will become a tool which will, which will help mainstream cultural aspects in the construction sector and thus support sustainability in the Nordic region and even broader. By considering the built environment as a whole, it is possible to find appreciation for traditional methods and materials. Furthermore, by drawing inspiration from built heritage, new and innovative methods and applications can be found. What's more, appreciation of culture, art and heritage in our built environment can greatly support well-being. They are also a part of the identity of places and local communities, the members of which should be able to influence the development of their surroundings. Dear friends, I am very happy that this Nordic project has a chance to take part in this first edition of the new European Bauhaus Festival. The new European Bauhaus provides a platform for European cooperation and co-design. Its values, beautiful, sustainable, together, summar summarize how our living environments could be re-imagined as part of the uh, green transition. Uh, 
Today's discussion will consider how the values of new European how, how Bauhaus could be interpreted in the Nordic context. In what ways can we in the Nordic countries take forward the movement? How can the movement foster hopeful tomorrow? On behalf of the Ministry of Education and Culture, I hope that this event organized together with the Finnish Culture Institute for the Benelux will inspire new ideas for cooperation. I look forward to the outcomes of today's exchanges. I wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you. There we are. Perfectly said. Everything was said, so couldn't have done it better. Um, as I mentioned just before, uh, we will ask for audience participation. This goes for the people out there as well. Uh, and just before we start with our keynote, and I will kind of go through how we intend to actually uh, reach the challenges that were set uh, right now, um, we have a little bit of a question for you, if possible, for the people online and the people right here, um, using, again, the magic of technology, if possible, we would have one question to ask you just so that we start the conversation a bit. And while that has been, there we go. If you could uh, find the QR code or the link to this website, we will kind of ask you for, never mind. I've, that's fine, this is, this is live, so this is the, the whole point. Um, you, in the emails you received this morning, there is a link to a questionnaire. If you mind uh, answering the question, we'd be actually interested in your opinions on this. But um, to the point of thinking about the new Bauhaus movement and the connection to the Nordics, we have uh, a great keynote in a second uh, from Massimo uh, Santanica. Uh, from the um, Iceland University of Arts, who will kind of give us maybe a broad scope on the conversation today and open up the conversation for us, uh, followed by a panel where we would kind of explore, as was mentioned just before, the kind of cultural aspects, the educational aspects, uh, how to actually bring in the new Bauhaus movement into the Nordics, how it affects it, how the Nordics affects the movement. Um, and then maybe in the second panel, after a short break, for all of you to actually meet up and discuss together, uh, we will have another panel to discuss maybe how to make that uh, re a reality. So what are the challenges? What are the drivers? What are the uh, benefits? How feasible it is? Uh, so that is kind of our, our morning. But kind of without further ado, um, if we have any results, Well, that's fine. I can then welcome Massimo to the stage. Um, so, an associate professor from the, in architecture. Yes, I um, was just made professor, actually, oh, last week. I am very sorry. <laughs> Please do update your bio online. Yes, I will. <laughs> this is not the first question I asked my analyst, um, who will give us a really interesting keynote and set the stage for this conversation. And if technology en en enables it, we might see a... Word cloud, which might also you can draw from in your own presentation. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Please. So, um, will you be able to see what I present on my screen on that one? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. It's really an honor for me to be with you. Um, very, very humbled, and uh, thank you to the Finnish Institute in Benelux. Thank you, Finland, for all these wonderful uh, initiatives that uh, involve education. And when it comes to education, I, I feel uh, strongly uh, passionate about. Uh, a friend of mine said that I am a pedagogical diva uh, because I really, uh, I really feel uh, that education is key to so many aspects in our contemporary life and the way we want to live harmoniously together. So I, and I also think that ed education is, is very much about the future and education is very much about uh, respect uh, and uh, really living together. Uh, 
So I want to cast with you a Nordic uh, Baltic perspective today, uh, which is very salt of, of, a, of a study that I have been conducted. Uh, but I want to start with a quotation actually that comes from an educator from, uh, from Africa uh, called Baba Dium. And he said, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And I, I completely agree. I think uh, that's why I, I see that education is not just about transmitting knowledge, but is also about connecting people and teach how to love uh, uh, our world and, uh, and each other. So um, I, I will structure this presentation in three, in three aspects. Uh, I will explain the genesis of this of a theory that I call the cosmopolitan citizenship in architectural education. I will try to explain its pedagogy. I'll show you uh, how we have been uh, uh, using it at the Iceland University of the Arts. And then I just have some concluding thoughts. So, um, Cosmopolitan citizenship architecture education is a theory, and, and this theory is grounded in a, in, a, in a Nordic Baltic context. And it has emerged by, <clears throat> by me conducting my PhD, which started in 2017. And this PhD was also a reaction to uh, the way we have been teaching architecture. Uh, so, um, so it involves uh, 19 schools of architecture. Uh, these are the 19 schools of architecture in the Nordic Baltic countries. And this is a map of these schools. So uh, as you can see on the top left corner, that's uh, where Iceland is, the Iceland University of the Arts. And then the other 18, uh, 18 schools are, uh, let's say, in continental Europe. We have three schools in Norway, four in Sweden, two in Denmark three in Lithuania, two in Latvia, uh, two in Estonia, and three in uh, Finland. So in the, last, uh, this, in the last four years, I have been talking uh, to many people in this network. This is a network that includes approximately 6,000 students in architecture. 60% uh, of the students are female. And together, we are uh, uh, roughly about uh, 850 educators and 60% of these educators are, uh, are male. So um, the Nordic Baltic perspective forms uh, a collective voice, which defines uh, the value of architectural education as the capacity to not only educate uh, professionals, uh, people who have a, a professional competence, the one of an architect, but also uh, um, architectural education as the quality to educate for cosmopolitan citizenship. That is to uh, educate people uh, in a seeing, questioning, understanding, responding, and imagining ways of living harmoniously together. So to educate engaged citizens aware of the world issues and also active in their communities. I, I, I need to define a little bit the terminology that, I, that I'm using because cosmopolitanism can lead maybe to, to misunderstanding of you thinking of a cocktail, which is always good. But uh, besides the cocktail, uh, uh, cosmopolitan uh, fundamentally is a Greek word, uh, a word that means uh, citizens of the world. So this is, uh, uh, this is an embedded concept that transcends uh, nationalities and even religions you will find this concept from the Assyrians to the Babylonians to the uh, even Maori of New Zealand. There is this concept that we belong always to two realities. We belong to our immediate uh, environment, but we also belong to something bigger and, and even greater. And citizenship uh, is the state of being a member of a particular group and behaving uh, responsibly. So cosmopolitan citizenship together is a juridical status, but it's also a civic and political agency, which positions everyone in terms of rights and responsibility into a larger uh, societal context. So cosmopolitan, citizens, uh, cosmopolitan citizenship, therefore, is, is a project uh, for education. This, this is a project that in Europe has been, uh, uh, has been very uh, uh, discussed and uh, therefore I feel particularly honored to be uh, here in Brussels, the heart of, of, of Europe and the European Union. 
And not so long ago in the Netherlands, in Maastricht, there was a, an agreement made called a Maastricht Global Education Declaration, which aimed at promoting citizenship and common values of freedom, tolerance, non-discrimination through education. Uh, so as we move in more multicultural and diverse societies, I think these values must be fundamental in, in, in the way we, uh, we want to educate the future generation. So this, this is, a, I want to read these definitions from the Council of Europe that are part of the Maastricht Declaration, which says global education opens people's eyes and minds to the realities of the world and awakens them to bring about a world of greater justice, equity, and human rights for all. And also, global education is understood to encompass development education, human rights education, education for sustainability, education for peace and conflict prevention, and intercultural education being the global dimension of education of citizenship. So when it comes to, to the Nordic uh, Baltic countries, I think, uh, I think we can all learn from, uh, I, I'm, of course I am biased, I'm based in Iceland, but uh, I also come from, from Italy. And I must say, I, I distinctly remember since I was a child to, to be kind of fascinated by this sense of transparency and democracy that I perceived to be associated with the Nordic countries. I decided to study architecture in, in Sweden because I liked the idea that uh, it was based on a very collaborative platform. And so it was a kind of, which is the one of the design studio. Uh, the design studio is uh, fundamentally the core of architectural education. It's a, it's a place where students and teachers work together. Students tend to have a dedicated space and in this space that act as a laboratory or, or a simulation of, a, of an architectural firm ideas are discussed and processed and collab collaboratively evolved. We should not take for granted this instrument uh, uh, at all because it's very specific of the Nordic Baltic countries. Uh, in Southern Europe, it does not really exist uh, uh, in the School of Architecture. It's more structured with a, a lecture in a big room and students work independently from home or they make their own working groups but usually they don't tend to have a dedicated space, an office to work together. So the presence of this space, I think, is really important to cultivate not only uh, knowledge formation, but also the social skills that uh, each profession requires. And so, uh, uh, as I was telling you, this is also my PhD, and my PhD uh, started with uh, uh, a sense of of malaise, a sense of maybe a little bit being lost, because um, the, the, especially uh, since 2017, architecture has always been asked to answer to the global issues, to answer to the issues of sustainability, to global challenges. And many commentators have fundamentally stated uh, the incapacity of the schools of architecture to produce these future professionals who can deal with the, with the climate change and CO2 emissions. So this research started asking three fundamental questions to more than hundreds educators and students across the Nordic Baltic uh, School of Architecture. That is both 19 schools that you saw in the map. And these three questions were uh, what traits students should have once they uh, become architects, they graduate as architects, how should these uh, uh, traits be taught? And also, how can, they, how can we make architectural education more socially relevant? So these three questions uh, generated many answers. And then I somehow I, I looked at these answers very carefully. I recorded this conversation and I analyzed and I interpreted uh, the, the findings. And I came up with this, with this map. So fundamentally, this map shows uh, this extraordinary coincidence that everyone, every word starts with a C. So it, it, somehow it questions a bit the validity because it seems, that, you know, it seems so uh, designed or over-designed by me. But I'm sure when we translated these words in other, uh, in other languages, uh, then they, the C coincidence will be dropped, probably especially in Finnish or in Icelandic. I Icelandic does not have the letter C at all. 
So uh, that's a problem solved in Iceland. But nevertheless, so these 15 traits that go from, uh, from concern to comprehension to confidence to creativity to courage and care, they, they also uh, put together, they, uh, they cover three different spheres of learning, the, the cognitive, the social, emotional, and the behavioral. So the, these three spheres, uh, uh, which are never really presented to a student of architecture, nevertheless, they become part of the edu education in architecture. And together, they weave a dense and intricate network of relations and connections and constitute the web necessary to imagine architects' multiple political agencies. So in this effort to imagine uh, different or, or new political agencies, uh, uh, five have emerged also from this, uh, from this research. And these political agencies are the one of the architect as a dissident intellectual, as a co-creative partner, an engaged storyteller, an ethical professional, and a carrier of the world. These roles do, do not want to substitute the one that is probably most commonly uh, um, associated to the one of the architect, that is the architect as the person who uh, draw a building, uh, makes drawings for something to happen. I mean, I'm not in a way challenging that definition. I'm just saying that a school of architecture provides uh, students with a good education, and this education can be used in multiple ways. And this is not, uh, uh, I'm not just supposing, this is actually a fact, this is a reality. There are studies being conducted in Europe, one is called Afterlife, that has um, followed the life of more than 13,000 architects after graduation. And basically this study says that only 30% of those graduates enter architectural firms and design buildings. The other 70% are still very active in the society, but in different means. So I, I want to spend a few minutes in explaining what these agencies are, uh, starting with the one of the dissident intellectual. So an architect, uh, architects as dissident intellectual, they, are, uh, they ask critical questions of societal relevance and use the design process to reveal social and environmental injustices and expose them to a larger audience. And by doing so, they are constantly redesigning the professional boundaries. And the engaged storyteller is, are presented as architects who use the design process as a narrative to reveal the voices of the others build understand, common understandings, form shared values, and imagining how we will live harmoniously together and communicate the whole with a larger audience. And the ethical professional is explained as architects capable of thinking in systems, understanding architecture as the result of a complex and multiple social, cultural, ecological, and economic relations which affect people, and places in present and future and in the near and global context. And the co-creative partners are architects who understand the creativity as a collaborative journey and use the design process as an occasion to redefine the meaning and scope of architecture and to forge new ways for cooperating and collaborating with experts and multiple stakeholders in the practice of architecture. And the last one, and I'm sorry for, uh, for this kind of reading uh, uh, from, but uh, uh, I think these are the best words that I came up to describe uh, this societal agency. And the last one is fundamentally the societal agency to use architecture as a practice for care uh, to improve local and global community. <clears throat> so these five political agencies, again, are strictly related. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are overlapped, they are intertwined, and they both describe and inspire architects to assume social roles in the community and beyond. <clears throat> so together, these 15 traits, the one that starts all with C, and these uh, five uh, uh, agency, they form what I call a theory. And the theory, as the Greek word uh, also says, it's, it's fundamentally theory means uh, it's a point of view. 
uh, which is gained through my interpretation of the studied phenomenon. It's a standpoint that can help students and teachers creating new political agency to co-design healthier, safer, and a fairer world in a changing social, ecological, and political environment. And again, a theory is, uh, you don't have to think of a theory in terms of uh, positivism terms as something that is undisputed or neutral or objective. Uh, a theory, actually the word theory and the word theories uh, share the same roots and the root is the one to, to visit. So uh, theory is just like taking a trip, it's about finding out things. So a theory is, uh, therefore reflects uh, my interest, of course, I am biased by my own interest, by my own uh, history, I am biased by my, uh, the historical context that we are all uh, living, and, and as such a theory has always a direction, an orientation, and a purpose, and they are always about something and context-based. So, my theory, therefore, is about understanding uh, that architecture needs to be more socially relevant and is not just an explorer of forms. But yet, if you would try to Google architecture, uh, you, you come up with images like this, and then if you Google sustainable architecture, you come up with images like this, but with a tree on top of the roof. Uh, like if planting a tree on top of a roof, then we solve all the problems of the world. Uh, so, yes, okay, architecture can be this, but I think it's, it's more than this, or it should be talked more than this, because architecture should be understood not uh, just as the physical object or the production of the physical object, but as the social and ecological relations that are embedded in the process of making architecture. And architecture uh, coordinates colossal expenditures of materials, of energy, it scripts forms of labor, in construction, in its operation, and in the program it houses, it is both a repository and generator of capital. I remember when I was a student in architecture in Italy, uh, uh, my uh, uh, professor said, architecture is the biggest investment that a person will ever do in, in his or her life. And he was fundamentally referring to uh, buying a home or, 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 or living in a certain place. So for many people still today, this is the biggest uh, investment that we make in our life. Therefore, architecture is, uh, is strictly connected to, to capital and, and to finance. And the process of making uh, or becoming an architect is one of learning socially appropriate avenues for creativity. So again, it's also about redefining how we look at architecture. And I think architecture has been taught, uh, and in a way the Bauhaus has also been uh, complicit uh, in, uh, in uh, fostering this image of the, of the hero, of Walter Gropius, or Miss van der Rohe, or this great, amazing uh, uh, man that we thought they made architecture. I mean, I completely f see myself as the victim of, of this. I was the guy with the poster of Le Corbusier on the wall. And this is absolutely fine, but we also need to understand that no one is an island, no one operates alone, and we need to understand that Miss van der Rohe had wonderful collaborators, many of whom were women, and, and, and we need to look at uh, not just to venerate the hero, but also the, 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 the relationships that, uh, that, that are at the base of making architecture. But yet, most architects consider buildings to be inert containers uh, that can be fixed and named as things rather than, than relationships. And of all the books in architecture that you can find in any library in the world, there are fundamentally only three books in the world that explain the object as a dialogue between the architect and the client. But all the other books fundamentally will tell you the story or from the architect's point of view. Um, so architecture uh, therefore has a responsibility in shaping our world, uh, but also architectural education has a responsibility in forming those architects to have a certain language that will help us to talk about <laughs> architectures probably rather than, uh, than architecture as plural and diverse. Uh, 
But nevertheless, architecture is uh, totally connected to, to the CO2 emissions. So construction industry accounts for about 38% of the CO2 emissions. And uh, a few years ago, it was reported the news of uh, Anderson Island in, in the South Pacific, not too far from New Zealand, where in an in a, in inhabited place, there were found 38 million pieces of plastic. And then by looking at this plastic, a lot of this plastic came from the construction industry, from Germany, from Canada, from Scandinavia. And so things travel around the world and ended up in this uh, uh, inhabited island. Architecture is also connected to the fact that more than 6,500 workers have actually died in Qatar to build uh, infrastructure and to build the architectural gems to host the, the World Cup. And when the architect or one of the architects was confronted with this number, uh, the answer was, I have nothing to do with the workers. So uh, I think, uh, yes, I mean, legally speaking, uh, uh, she was right. Uh, mm, so legally speaking, uh, uh, it's the correct answer. But on the other hand, if, if architecture claims to have a societal role, then we also need to claim more of the responsibilities and how architecture is not just drawn, but it's also how architecture is built and by whom and under what conditions. So the ongoing environmental crisis, social inequality and spread of zoonotic diseases need to constitute the premise and scope of scholarly investigation. And I think this is beyond architecture or engineering. This is about, uh, is about education. They need to be part of the educational discourse in architecture, form our individual and collective planetary consciousness and unite as we move towards their uh, solution. These issues reflect not our lack of knowledge, but our inability to fully care for each other and our planet as a whole. They reflect the way we have been designing the world so each design project is therefore a social and a physical modifier and understanding what is modified and who is affected is a matter of responsibility for an architect and this has become increasingly also more difficult to, uh, to understand. It was in a way easier uh, many, many years ago when architecture was built with local materials, when there was a much greater understanding of how things are connected with each other. Therefore, you would come to uh, Brussels and see a specific stone. You would travel to Amsterdam and see a city built of bricks and Helsinki of granite and so on. But today, uh, as an uh, uh, Australian philosopher and eco-feminist uh, Vala Plamud reminds us, uh, we live in shadow places. Fundamentally, she says that uh, we need, it's very important to understand that our local places are never dissociated nor dematerialized from their uh, world context. Whether this is architecture or the breakfast outside, I'm pretty sure that if we just look at the breakfast, we know that the coffee comes from far away and, uh, and I don't know about the rest. But most certainly, when you are in Iceland, almost nothing of what you eat comes from Iceland. Uh, and so we, we are always incredibly connected to each other, even if it's not probably immediate, uh, immediately obvious to us. So this is why cosmopolitan citizenship is so important. It's about understanding the interconnectedness of everything. It's about renewing our commitment to the profession, but also the responsibility that is embedded in the profession. Although uh, Leopold was talking about that we need to be citizens of the world and as such act in the interest of the entire ecosystem in which we belong. Martha Nussbaum talks about uh, cosmopolitan as the person whose allegiance is to the worldwide community of human beings. While the architect uh, Asan Fathi says that the architect needs to be educated as a citizen of the world and not just as the guardian of a small part of it. And then uh, Hannah Arendt talks about that for an architect, the world is always common, is always in relation to a community, to people. It is shared and as such, making is always political as it concerns uh, us all. Therefore, it's also really important to understand who is making and for whom. Uh, that's why the voice of the others should, should be 
become part of, 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 of the voices of, of the decision making. So after this long <laughs> genesis of the theory, I, I want to uh, maybe explain a little bit more. OK, having said all of this, once you enter in a classroom, how do you change teaching? I mean, that's also the most difficult thing. How do you translate this very, in a way, high thoughts into an activity that you can do with your student in a classroom? Because fundamentally, that's your job. I mean, my job uh, is the one to enter a design studio and work with my students and educate them on one hand to help them to become architects uh, uh, so that they can claim this title and use it in Europe. On the other hand, I, I also know that this title is, is, uh, leads to many possibilities. So there is something that is specific to each student that you have to help the students to, to discover and, 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 and be confident about. So, uh, becoming cosmopolitan citizens architects require, I think, the right education, that is to form socially aware, critical professional, who understand that we live in a system of complex connections and interrelationships that links us all. It's also about creating a, a pedagogy, and a pedagogy as Henry Giroux calls it. Henry Giroux is an American uh, educator and pedagogue. Uh, so it defines a pedagogy, a particular version or envision of a civic life, the future, and how we might construct representations of ourselves, others, and our physical and social environment. A pedagogy for cosmopolitan citizenship therefore transforms uh, architectural schools into social platforms, places for cooperation among different stakeholders, places to reach out and connect to society places where students, teachers, and outsiders can solve problems together and imagine a common future in a respectful, caring, yet critical spirit. So I, uh, uh, there are two fundamental questions that I like to address with the students in architecture. The one to always make them think of design and politics as something not disconnected, but as something totally connected. So the question is, what is the design of what is the politics of your design and what is the design of your politics? And again, I think this is important because my education was different, was, uh, and, uh, was more like apolitical. I mean, you start from design, therefore design is neutral, therefore design is, uh, is something uh, uh, but almost felt that it was emerging from a vacuum, not from a real social context. And, 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 I, and that always bothered me about my education, uh, which was at the beginning in Italy, but it was different, I think, in, uh, in Stockholm. Nevertheless, this requires an openness in guaranteeing that all learners have equal access to education and that the educational community truly represents the diversity of the world that is intended to serve. So in a time of growing nationalism, xenophobic attitudes and global crisis, citizenship must be understood in relational terms as citizens of the natural world bound to a common destiny. And therefore, to be an architect, one must become a cosmopolitan citizen, a person connected to the world, bound to its people, and acting for the greater good. Without this openness and generosity, the agency of architecture fails to accomplish its public mission. So I actually have decided also to give you a break from me <laughs> talking incessantly to, to have a small video that shows uh, something that my students and I did together. Uh, and we work with an elderly house in uh, Reykjavik. And there should be some music uh, into this video, which the students made themselves. But I'll let you listen, then we, we talk about it. Sorry, I'm going to pause it a second. Ah, OK. Do you mind if I start again?
I think fundamental, sorry, I just try to. Right. Yes, okay. You, you, you saw basically uh, all of it. Um, so fundamentally, fundamentally, um, we started uh, the design process not by thinking. Uh, uh, we need to build a new elderly house or, or, or home, but uh, we started the design process to, with this simple intention to, to get to know uh, the people themselves. In this case, was, were the elderly people. So we spent five weeks uh, with them and the students uh, conversed. And as you gather from this presentation, at the end of these five weeks, there wasn't really a drawing or a map uh, or, or a section of a building, but there was a book that basically was collecting stories from these elderly people, because fundamentally it was understood that it was the most important thing to, to document their lives and, and, and start the design process with this understanding. Then there were actually amazing projects that were developed out of this. But it was the beginning of a design process that uh, was uh, different from what uh, has been happening in my school before. Uh, and so I, uh, um, I, I, when, we, it, we, when it comes to the pedagogy and the design studio culture, uh, um, I address five questions, uh, which I think are pretty univers universal. They are not really specific to, to Iceland. Or, or to my school, but these five questions, uh, I invite other educators in architecture to use it in their design studios. And these questions are, uh, is the design studio open to the diversity of the world? I mean, uh, who is present and who is missing in the design studio among our students, teachers, textbooks, references, guest teachers, voices, perspectives, standpoints, epistemologies and methodologies of learning? And another question is, are critical questions asked in the design studio? So does the design studio provide the learning environment for students to make use of their experiential knowledge? Uh, so this concern, of course, critical thinking and, and problem posing. And then a third question is, is the design studio engaged with its community? So that, does the design studio allow students to make experience of their own place? Does the design studio allow students to think in systems? And this is also very much about uh, providing an education that is place-based, but also world-related. And then another question is, does the design studio encourage dialogue and collaboration among students, teachers, and the other? So does the design studio encourage participatory learning? And then the last one, does the design studio lead to action? So does the design studio promote creativity and civic engagement? Because I don't think education should be just a rehearsal for future practice. I think education should be really a moment to engage with our society in the present, in this amazing situation that you are a student and an educator. So it's not just a rehearsal, it's life really itself. So I want to conclude, uh, 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 I just have a few slides left. So I want to conclude, conclude uh, referring to the Bauhaus. So the, Bau, the Bauhaus was a project fundamentally to reform education that uh, led to amazing artifacts, objects, uh, and great architecture. But it started as a project of education. 
and a project that believed that design, art, and architecture were all interconnected and that together we could build a better society. But there is also a, another side to the Bauhaus, which is this side here, that, uh, that fundamentally uh, we should not forget that the Bauhaus charged women more than men uh, in terms of tuition. So women had to pay more to be in the school, and also women were denied to study architecture. They could choose between weaving or pottery, but not architecture, uh, because women were considered not to have the special intelligent, uh, intelligence necessary to, uh, to be an architect. So, I like the Bauhaus, but up to a certain point, I think uh, uh, we need to update it. And here I think where the Nordic Baltic context can really help uh, uh, greatly because now I don't want to boast, but maybe we should since we are here celebrating Finland, but we, we have the best uh, education in the world. In terms of human rights, it's also a very good uh, place to be. So these soft skills or societal skills should really make a difference in the way we educate each other. We, uh, when we think to the new European Bauhaus, I think we ought to think it as a project of education, which should be more collaborative, more inclusive and more caring. And when it comes to care, uh, I want to quote uh, uh, this book, Matters of Care, by Maria Puig de la Bella Casa, who says, care is everything that is done to maintain, continue and repair the world so that all can live in it as well as possible in a complex, life-sustaining web. So when we think of the new European Bauhaus, we ought to think it as a project of education, but also it has to be a, a project to challenge stereotypes, give a voice to the most silence and celebrate diversity and difference. So each project of education is a political project, so let's be bold and use this platform to think in together and make new policy also for the new European Bauhaus. So I want to conclude this lecture um, or presentation by suggesting three uh, policies that we could maybe try to implement. One, to, uh, to use the project of education for any education in the world also as a project for cosmopolitan citizenship. So uh, as something that, uh, um, a project to develop it, un the understanding that architecture matters. And, a, a, and as such, it is about understanding and designing the relationship among us. Two, also to make education in, in architecture compulsory in primary education. So since we live in, in a world that is more urbanized than ever, since more than 50% of the humanity live in cities, since we live in, in an environment that is designed by humans, I think the understanding of how to design this environment should be part of the primary education, not just a, a, a matter of or concern of architecture. And then number three, and the last one, uh, the, the profession and education of an architect in Europe is regulated by the professional qualification directives that since uh, um, uh, by the Council Directive 85. And these uh, directives uh, state 11 points that all schools of architecture in Europe have to fulfill in order to graduate architects. These points are very interesting and very necessary. They are about uh, forming the understanding of knowledge and skills and culture. But I, I want to suggest the last point, uh, the point that comes really from the Nordic Baltic perspective and, and from this study that I have presented to you. It's a, it's a point that already in 2013, uh, uh, Professor Yuli Sulep from Tallinn, from ECA Tallinn, uh, was stating that we need to complement the 11 points of the professional qualification directives with subject areas that are important in the Nordic Baltic area, like sustainability, global warming, professional ethics, and transformation of civic societies. So I suggest that the last, uh, uh, last uh, directive could uh, be script like this, to understand that uh, creating an understanding that architecture is about how we live harmoniously together. As such, architects carry the ethical responsibility as cosmopolitan citizens to care for the others, for present and future global communities of human beings and earthlings. Thank you.
faccio la domanda. Grazie. <laughs> Prego. Um, that was you did beautifully the setting of a stage, I think, for the rest of the conversation. <laughs> I mean, we went from, you know, the global tension to local, yeah. uh, the generational uh, as, a, as a, an educator. Um, so I think we have our work cut out for us after with the panels, but a lot of really interesting ideas. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, and talking about the kind of global and local tension, it has come to my attention that um, some of our uh, listeners and viewers in the rest of the world, not this are having a tiny bit of a technical issue. So we're going to take a five-minute break uh, just to solve those and then move on to the next panel. So thank you very much. While they reboot, we can have a little conversation here or you can have a break. It depends on... Welcome back. Um, so again, uh, we just had Massimo give us a really broad and beautiful framing for the rest of the conversation. And we're going to segue to our first panel conversation about the new Bauhaus uh, movement, which I remind uh, the key terms are sustainable, beautiful, and together. And to see that maybe in the Nordic context of what does that mean in those countries, in those cultures, and how can that evolve over the next few uh, years, months, decades of uh, work. For this conversation to happen, I'm very, very happy to have three amazing panelists with me. Um, so, Efe Ogbaide from Finland, who is uh, the founder of FEMA. Pronounced it correctly, I think. <laughs> Good. I wasn't sure about the double M. Ogbaide. Ogbaide. That, that was the that one was. I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, which is an urban planning collaborative, collective, sorry. Uh, agency. Agency. Yeah. <laughs> Doing, I'm going to get there. Um, Malin um, Kok Hansen from Norway, from the, uh, who's a senior associate at Design Architecture in Norway, correct? Yes. Good. And all in English terms, so that's perfect. <laughs> and Carmen Garcia Sanchez, uh, 
from, who is an architect and also a researcher from uh, the Royal Academy of Denmark, correct? Royal Danish Academy. Academy. Yes. There we go. That's what I thought. <laughs> um, so my first question to the panel is, if you had to choose one main idea, main thing that we should talk about here, given that we're talking about beauty, we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about togetherness, in the Nordic context, the new Bauhaus movement, what, what should we really discuss? What makes it kind of unique in that context? Well, I can start uh, because I was, I was, uh, we got that question uh, in, in before uh, coming here. And I was reflecting on that because I think uh, um, the strength with the uh, new European Bauhaus program is uh, exactly the opposite to see all of these three together because I think that's what we are missing um, to get where we need to get. Uh, and uh, and um, because we have, I mean, as I see it, we have, we have uh, at least in Norway, we have focused a lot on the sustainable development goals, uh, the 17 goals uh, from UN. And, uh, and they are also like providing a very good joint framework. Um, but they are still, it's difficult to see them like how to, how are they connected and how to work with all the 17 goals in relation to each other. Uh, so as I see it, uh, what is the strength of the new European Bauhaus program is that exactly to, to see, it's like a joint vision gathering all these kind of perspectives together. Uh, and making us like forcing us to to uh, yeah to take into consideration uh, all three of them, and I think that's uh, very important. And uh, I uh, I also think that's an, a huge opportunity um, for us in the Nordic region as well, because I mean, obviously we are doing good on, in 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 some areas, but uh, but we still have a lot of improvement to do. And I think this. Uh, Mm, I mean, the, to, to collaborate and to, to break those silos, which we are always talking about. Uh, I think that's uh, one of our like, biggest missions. And I think that uh, the new European Bauhaus can be that kind of vision that helps us to do that. And Please. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to agree with you, Malin. Um, and I also, when Massimo had, uh, you, when you had your talk, I actually, I wanted to add multidisciplinary. Mm. Uh, I sometimes feel, I'm not an architect, so maybe this is a bit like uh, and coming from envy or wanting to be <laughs> one. I don't know. <laughs> he painted such a beautiful picture of architects, so, <laughs> like, you know, so. Yeah, it's... yeah. Um, but sometimes I feel architects have this uh, urge to solve everything, but like, I think collaboration could be not only with, you know, Peop, us people who live and use the architecture, but also like other professions mm. who maybe would have understanding about the society. So in a way, I, I would really hate to choose only <laughs> one of them. If I can put all the words together, I would have like one word with all of them. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't making, forcing that choice. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that, um, come in as, an, as the architect. Of yeah, <laughs> um, I'm, I would like to say I'm not just a researcher. I am a practicing architect. I have designed mainly um, social housing buildings in Madrid. And I think that, uh, of course, the role of architects and designers, it's an important role in this change of the world that we need urgently. But uh, as they said, uh, we need uh, to work together uh, and, of course, to educate uh, our students at the architecture schools. It's very important uh, to have a kind of anthropological approach, and that is what we do at the School of Denmark, uh, but also to educate people, uh, uh, common people. And this is something that has uh, a tradition in Denmark. You talk to anyone and most of the people have a kind of um, critical thinking and quite good criteria about architecture. So I think that is important. And also policymakers should help us. We can't do everything by ourselves. It's a great change and great changes need a, a great com a com commitment of other agents, agents implicated. I would also would like to, to bring a new thing that um, 
we haven't heard here. I think it's something that uh, in the Nordic countries, or at least in the architecture of the Nordic countries, or the tradition, um, existed, and it is the connection to nature. That, um, and of course, this um, issue uh, pointed out by Massimo about architecture uh, as a tool to increase our health and also our well-being. Uh, it's an important uh, matter, and nature is the tool to do it. We, we are disconnected of nature uh, due to this um, growing of the cities, and we don't have daily contact with nature, um, much more in other countries of Europe, but of course also in Denmark, for instance. Um, and I think that is another issue, and it's the, the lost piece of the puzzle of sustainability. Uh, contact with nature uh, brings us many benefits. For instance, um, uh, we feel um, healthier, we, we have a, a stronger feeling of uh, well-being, uh, we reduce the um, stress, we are more creative, and this is important not only for artists, also for other professions. Um, I think this is an important thing, and in the Nordic architecture tradition, uh, we have many uh, examples, and I think that we should recover the relations, and in these Nordic countries we have the chance to, to lead this um, new approach that is called biophilic design, then this is the new approach and it has this new label called biophilia. That means uh, it's related, it is related to our ancestral need of living in contact with nature. But uh, this label is new, but uh, the concept is not new. And some Nordic architects were aware of this. For instance, the uh, master, the Finnish master, Alvar Aalto, also the Swedish master, uh, Gunnar Asplund, uh, Kai Fisker in Denmark, or John Hudson. Um, Arnie Korsmo in Nor Norway, sorry, because I don't know how to pronounce it correctly. Yeah, and this is a new issue, I'm sorry, but I think I should... I, I think the it. whole point of the panel is to <laughs> come up with mm. these ideas, and yeah. so please don't apologize for actually bringing up the yeah. new ideas. And I also see that the two other panelists are kind of agreeing with you mm. with that connection mm. to nature. So um, I hear a lot of the like, connection between the different uh, disciplines. Um, uh, and connection to nature, and at the same time, as an external, maybe, uh, see, I'm not from the Nordics uh, myself, but I think that, as you said, uh, the Nordic countries are quite advanced, and it's not to say that that is maybe sufficient, but what are the challenges, or what, where do you see growth or improvements on these um, different challenges that you mentioned, either the connections to, between the different disciplines or, or with nature? How, how can we maybe do something there, improve that? What, what examples do you think? Well, have? globally, I think we should go uh, forget this outdated um, thought uh, or understanding that culture and nature are different things. We have to change uh, the relationship between nature and architecture and be aware that human beings, beings are nature too and to have a closer understanding or an anthropological uh, understanding of architecture um, to think that buildings are not just containers that uh, maybe they, they should be designed at a human size scale that they are not just self containers um, and that we should design um, um, an architecture of relations avoid to be disconnected as Massimo pointed out but of course it's um, it needs a lot of work of any of all of us. Uh, yeah. Please. Or did you want? To? No, 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 you no. can. I, uh, you you can start. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> whoever would jump in first. So yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm also. I totally agree with the na nature part. Um, and what what I feel, and maybe coming from a Finnish context and from like a perspective of an urban planner, I I feel urban planning, especially in the bigger cities in Finland, is like in a, in a, in a very, I'm very concerned how, how it is done. And like the scale is very big. There is no green areas. It's very like effi efficiency and like uh, economic or oriented. And I feel like, yeah, people are, are forgotten. And also 
and environment and animals and, and so on. So definitely there should be a change in that. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, when it comes to, to bringing these uh, different like disciplines together, which we are, I mean, very much uh, talking about, I, I would also say that uh, what we need to do is then to establish arenas where these people actually can meet uh, and uh, um, try to understand each other's perspectives and learn from each other. Because that's, uh, uh, I think that's also uh, very much lacking that we have a lot of like different uh, arenas and networking occasions, that, but then we are talking to our like-minded uh, like uh, people uh, to a very large extent, and we are meeting the, the people that uh, think the same as we do and, uh, and don't really like challenge uh, our mindset uh, and bring in those different perspectives uh, to make us see, uh, well, the problem that needs to be solved from, a, from another point of view. Uh, so I think, and that will never happen uh, by itself, uh, we need to establish those arenas where where we can meet uh, cross disciplinary and uh, and uh, work together and act together and also with not only now we are talking uh, a lot about like different disciplines but I also think it uh, it uh, I mean it uh, should also be like cross sectorial um, public private uh, and also. Um, of course, I mean, uh, cross-cultural and uh, different ages. Uh, to, so I, I really think that's, uh, um, that's something that we have to, to consider, like how, how to get all these perspectives and, and, uh, mm, and yeah, again, uh, break those silos, uh, even though it's, uh, it's getting a little bit like old uh, to talk about the, the silos, but, but still it's a, it's, a, it's a huge issue. And, uh, and uh, I often like when I go to all these conferences and networking events and you think that you, you have come up with so many new ideas and great thoughts, but then in the end you realize you have just talked to the people that uh, <laughs> think and act and uh, they are yes, uh, the same as, as you do and, and yeah, agree with you. And so how much further have we actually then gotten? Um, so I think, um, yeah, um, I think that's that's one of the things we have to consider how to how to establish those arenas where we actually can meet and discuss these things across sectors and and disciplines. I think I mean really interesting point. I actually think that uh, there are different disciplines and countries on stage and. Uh, within this project and this kind of conference. So mm. uh, kind of if I take, because I don't think necessarily that the Nordic countries are homogenous in any way. So there's probably some interaction there. Mm. But even beyond that, how do you see maybe the Nordics relating to the rest of Europe? Um, Carmen, you already mentioned a, a few aspects with the relationship to nature, for example. But what would be for you at least your desired Kind of maybe contribution or at the same time learning from other areas if you've kind of considered that within kind of we are in brussels after all so i'm you know yeah. throwing it out there the european position or, or cosmopolitan one if we want to open to the world <laughs> um, again sorry looking at massimo for the people who can't see that but um, is there any aspect that you think would be particularly valuable to confront as you say because that could be a source of great learning and this question goes for everyone on the panel, obviously. But... Well, um, I think we have, uh, have a lot to learn. Um, and, uh, and I also must say that uh, um, because, I mean, we have, uh, in the Nordic region, we have a, a quite uh, well-functioning uh, welfare system. Uh, and we also have some, some fun fundamental uh, fundamental values that we have, that we share, like uh, trust and uh, equity and uh, um, transparency um, and so on. Uh, so I think that in the Nordic region, um, as I see it, uh, the new European Bauhaus movement is should not only be uh, a possibility; it should be more like an obligation uh, for us to. To, to really um, 
push ourselves uh, and uh, and uh, develop the the solutions uh, that are needed in order to solve um, all these challenges. And uh, so so I think that we definitely. Uh, should look at the rest of the world also to to what can we what can we learn uh, from uh, from other places and for example uh, when it comes to sustainability and um, um, circular economy that was discussed in the event yesterday uh, I think there and resilience I think there are in many aspects uh, there are places which have uh, uh, which are in in in, in like frontrunners, uh, and that we also should, should, uh, should learn from them. Um, because, I mean, because of the, our, our welfare system and, uh, and uh, in the Nordics, uh, sometimes we perhaps tend to think that we are the frontrunners in, in every aspect, but uh, I, I definitely don't think that's the case, and, uh, and uh, we need to also seek all the inspiration from... Uh, from other places in the world, uh, but I still think that we have the the position and the possibility to to really well embrace this movement and and the values and uh, and uh, uh, develop the the solutions that uh, Europe and, and the world is looking for. Yeah, and I I have to admit, like as a Finnish person uh, and like a Finnish urban planner, I rarely look at any, anywhere else and maybe that's a problem that we we should uh as you as you said cooperate more also and see what other solutions and get inspiration from other other places as well uh i also maybe wanted to add um you talked about the welfare system and well then i started to think about the welfare state and like the history of the nordic countries we all share that wel welfare system and that is actually something that is now crumbling, at least in Finland. I don't know how the situation is in Denmark. And at the same time, there is a lot of uh, global issues and migration. Like mm. we are in like, a, um, how, how do you say? A lot of things will be changing and we have to find in a way, new ways to maybe hopefully maintain the well welfare system and like the good, good cities. So I, I think that is something we cannot do with the old old way, how, how we're used to build like the Finnish or Swedish or Norwegian ci or Danish cities. Uh, so maybe we should also look back into the history, but also into more cosmopolitan, like, uh, or take like more cosmopolitan perspective uh, so that we can create something, uh, something new that takes into regard to something old and something like from the global or like cosmopolitan sphere. I think there's a yeah, there's a very interesting aspect of the fact that the context is changing as well, um, and the mm -hmm. climate, uh, and that in a way our built environment probably has to follow all that trend. And so countries have been seeing those effects or have the different climates that will uh, come to the Nordics. So there is obviously because of that changing context, countries who have gone through that so or have the aspects that maybe of uh, of value in a way of that perspective. So yeah, I think that's, that, that's a very interesting point. Um, you, I mean, besides the connection to nature, which I, I you know, uh, very much understand and see each time I, I, I have the possibility to visit the North that I, I get that glimpse uh, coming from a city from, I live in Paris, very little <laughs> nature there. Um, <laughs> any other aspects that you think that kind of challenge I, I quite like the idea of saying, like, we need to push ourselves, that level of agency that you were asking of yourself and of others. Where, where would, you know, should we kind of I, um, try to do that? Well, I think that some values that have been already pointed out, like, for instance, to design um, um, according to the context and, and to preserve the essence of the place and to maintain the identity of the place. We have to design new buildings, of course, but people, needs to, people need to, to feel attached to the place, to feel happy. And uh, each country and each place have a, um, has a different um, identity. So we should maintain this. And for instance, uh, thinking about sustainability and to reduce old buildings, uh, some of them uh, has 
uh, have this quality of uh, linking us to the place, and that is an important thing for hum human beings. Um, but I think that new architecture, uh, when we are thinking about uh, protecting some buildings, should be uh, useful uh, for many changes that we are living. So the capacity of some buildings to be transformed and to be used for other things, uh, not for the initial use, uh, it's a thing that we should um, uh, look for when we design. And I think it is also a need because sustainability could be also um, um, be uh, regarded to protect what we already have, to depart from our own resources, not to, just to think about how to design new buildings, how to design the old buildings or to transform them uh, to, to maintain this identity, this Finnish or Danish or Norwegian identity, also Spanish identity, of course. That's a, I mean, like, that is a pretty, and I'm glad Massimo made such a big deal about architecture and the rest of that uh, field and that responsibility. But that's a very, I would say, difficult challenge to, or tension to find between, uh, you've been saying so much is changing, the context is changing, evolving, we need to actually accelerate it, we need to challenge ourselves, we need to, uh, this new European Bauhaus, and at the same time, maintain these identities. How do you as the professionals you are in the fields you represent, like take this on, take this challenge to both kind of keep the old or define what we want to keep mm. and then define what we want to change. Realize it's not an easy question, so please go at it for like, you know, but uh, I'd love to hear how you think about these, that, that tension feels very difficult to, to realize and, and, and at the core of what it is you do. I, I feel sometimes when we talk about innovation or, or new, we tend to try to solve issues or problems that actually are not issues. Um, so I don't know, in a, in a way, I, I think we should really like try to understand what, what are the problems, what are the old, old uh, or historical things that we could maybe start to keep, um, and does everything really have to change. Uh, I, I feel we have a lot of the solutions, like if we think about, uh, we have like the technology, uh, we know if we preserve green areas, that would be good from many uh, like uh, pers perspectives. Like I feel we have all the solutions. So in a way it's like a mindset we should change and we should be more bold uh, into like, uh, not only looking at innovation and like changing everything, but looking like uh, Th those things that like already are working and you used to used to work and maybe strengthen like i don't think it's like a really difficult math like you talked about the eco ecological things like just don't cut the trees like <laughs> don't big um, don't build so big scale or you know i think there are solutions already but like uh, we sometimes maybe do not look at the easy solutions we're trying to aim too high if you know what i mean mm. Well, I think uh, um, it's uh, ma very much related to what we discussed in the in the beginning that all these three aspects should be looked at at like uh, at the same time, and that we should uh, I mean we should not uh, think either beautiful or sustainable or inclusive. I mean we sh we, we should look at the at it in a holistic way and how we can grasp all of these three aspects uh, at once. And I think that's uh, very much related to, to this discussion and uh, uh, on, on what, to, what to keep and, and what, to, to, uh, what new solutions uh, we need. Uh, because of course it's also a, like a sustainability uh, question that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, for example, now today it's it's much e easier and and cheaper uh, also uh, to to demolish an existing building and and, and build a new one um, and, uh, and maybe that's something that we should reconsider. I mean, um, when it comes to to circular economy and and uh, and uh, what possibilities do we have like of of using the existing uh, buildings that we already have and uh, existing materials, but also like uh, Carmen said, like the reuse. Of, uh, of buildings, um, and that's also uh, something that we, I mean, 
obviously also it's it's quite fascinating that we have how many buildings uh, that are empty uh, in uh, uh, in a, like a huge part of the uh, of the time they are, are just uh, standing there empty and and uh, not being used for everything and uh, for nothing uh, so um, so I think uh, I think uh, looking at all these perspectives uh, uh, in a in from a holistic point of view and and uh, and not considering only one of them, I think we will uh, it will be easier for us to to find uh, the good solutions. And then I think, for example, circular economy is uh, is one of the one of the key tools. Um, and uh, and not only think like how can we build smarter, new, energy-efficient buildings, uh, but, uh, but uh, more think about like what constructions and buildings uh, do we have and how can we use them in a different way. And maybe to add to that, like having like a longer perspective, like I feel like uh, <laughs> construction today, in Finland at least, aims for 50 years mm. and it should aim for a thousand years. So, you know, and also like you talked about holistic perspective, like okay, maybe if we build a building that will last for a thousand years, it will cost a lot, but on the long term, it will save us more money and environment and planet. So in a way, like we really need to see the connections to a lot of, a lot of things and like have like a longer perspective as well, how, how we count this kind of system sustainability and like... Yeah, and then find solutions for like how maybe the, 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 the like need for that building or the use, usage of that building then can change Both. over time because we have those good solutions to, to, to look at like how can that building then be transformed into mm. different uh, needs mm. uh, instead of like, yeah, demolishing it and, and building a new one. Yeah. Mm. I think that it's also very important that uh, research and practice at the architecture schools are together, should be together. Um, uh, I also think that um, uh, this concept of beauty, um, yesterday I attended a, a conference uh, by Shigeru Ban and he explained how people take care of things that they consider beautiful. Oh. So, and there is a lot of things there are a lot of things uh, about beauty to be read, so um, I think that is a, a good thing to protect the beauty of our uh, buildings, mm. of our cities, and also to consider that uh, it is not just about buildings, it's also about um, the space between buildings. In Denmark, for, for, instance, there, there, for instance, there is a great tradition of landscaping, mm. and when we, you live in a city where landscape has been thought uh, by professionals, you are uh, much more happy. That is my experience living in Denmark. Mm. I live there because I chose it. Mm. Um, um, so I think that we have to work together. Of course, it's a difficult task, but uh, well, I think I never like uh, easy things. I have to say, I prefer the challenges. I, I, I get this feeling from the panel. <laughs> like, but... If we work together, we have more options. Um, and I also think that professionals should be listened. Sometimes you have the feeling, as an architect in my case, that, um, that policymakers are not interested in, in knowing what you have to say, and that is not a good way to work. I, I, I mean, you brought in quite a few things, but I, just to stay on the art part, but I think like the aesthetics and, and, and art in general, um, was not a part of the conversation, which unfortunately is already uh, running out of time. But um, mm. is there is there a place? I imagine the answer, the easy answer, is yes. I'm asking about that place. But is there a place for art within that kind of larger collaboration that you see both also for solving these questions of tying with the culture, but also kind of tying in with the other people that, you know, the policymakers, the users, the, is, is that a tool that you think of, that you utilize, that or, or, or is yet to be connected? Hmm. I would like to point out the sentence that Massimo shared about, uh, I don't remember it well, but it, it was about, if you teach me, I appreciate things and and uh, in reverse, so if you, um, mm, you if people thing, is yeah. educated uh, and understand what is beautiful, um, they enjoy it much more. So education, it's 
uh, very important. I think it has a very a key role. Yeah, I don't know if I have answer. I, <laughs> to be honest, with these topics, I'm I'm surprised. Like, I don't <laughs> think there's any one sentence that. I mean, if we can get it, I'd be very very happy. But uh, I'm not necessarily looking for that. It's it branches out. It's good. Uh, sorry, go on, Efe. Uh, yeah, maybe like like regarding like if art should be part of uh, like. Uh, urban planning or ar architecture, yeah, yes, for sure. And maybe I also start to think the um, uh, quote that Massimo had, and I start to think like beauty is very something that is in the eye of a beholder, subjective, or how do you say? Subjective. So then I feel there is a risk, uh, because in Finland, for example, with the demolition things, now they are demolishing um, housing areas that are built in the 90s and 70s and 60s, because uh, they are not like appreciated like aesthetically, so I think there is a risk in in a way. Like if we if we talk about this kind of beauty and like of course like if you even though you would teach it, it's still like uh, depends on like how people value, value things. It sh still should be taught, but I think we should be careful uh, with this kind of or like try try to see how can we make beautiful uh, for a thousand years so that people even in thousand years will appreciate it and not like think, ah, oh, this was ugly or mm. let's demolish it and forget about it. So, yeah, beauty with caution. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's very true. And I also, I, I think um, also it's sort of connected to like the, the sense of belonging and also like uh, the inclusion aspect, because of course, I mean, if you like talking about like the cultural heritage and uh, but also when we are living in a, in a global world like how do we embrace all those cultures in our in our cities and uh, living in environments and uh, well, urban environments and uh, and also uh, uh, to be able to to actually create that sense of belonging uh, in a place and uh, and that you um, and that's also, of course, related to, to the inclusiveness. Like, how do we, how do we make uh, again? I mean, what is what is considered art and what is considered beautiful, and how do we make uh, all kinds of different voices heard and uh, and uh, enab enable them to to contribute to mm. to that? Uh, for example, what is uh, I mean, how to how to fill our uh, cities and and places with. With, with beautiful things uh, and representing then different cultures and aspects and generations and so on uh, in order to, to create that sense of belonging. I think that's also very important. Oh, there's so many questions. But there's, thank God there's a second panel. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much. We, we have, I'm trying to find, there's no good moment to this, stop this conversation. So I'll do it kind of blatantly, but we have five minutes maybe before uh, the break are there any questions from the... Yes, I thought there might be. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm just going to repeat that last sentence for the people who, because we don't have a like mic passing it. So, how, so, how to build cities that facilitate community? Small, perfect question. Thank you. <laughs> easy, easy question. I'm so glad I'm not part of the panel. Yeah. Go on, yeah. please. I, I think I would be in Bahamas if I really knew the question. To yeah. that. <laughs> but I, I think at least there is like things what not to do, <laughs> like we talked about demolition and these kind of things. Uh, I, I think like building community is a very long-term process and like it's not only about build building. It, I, I mentioned like the multidisciplinary uh, disciplinary approach, like we need like uh, not only urban planners, architects, we need social, sociologists, uh, private public sector and like work like <laughs> Like understand what lo uh, what is needed locally, and then like taking that into the decisions uh, when we form the cities. But I, I think there is no easy answer, in my opinion, to that. And it, like it's it's a huge issue for mm. for sure. 
how, how to do that. And of course you can, uh, I mean, you can think about like different aspects, like how you like with regulations make, uh, um, um, for example, in Denmark, they have like this 25% uh, of the um, of the apartments in if, when building a new building block, 25% of the uh, apartments need to be like uh, affordable housing or, or social housing to get like this mixed uh, population. And uh, um, but I think uh, so. Of course, there may be even some re regulative. Uh, uh, issues, uh, but but I think also like uh, Carmen also mentioned this like space between the buildings, and I think that's uh, very important. Like even though you have an area which is maybe um, um, well uh, for a wealthier part of the population, to still make that uh, that uh, space between the buildings and uh, and. Uh, like the democratization of space, that it's still uh, accessible and possible for everyone in the city to come uh, and use the, the, the public areas and, uh, and enjoy these areas uh, for uh, yeah, um, different activities. So I think that's, um, that's also very important to not, as, I mean, to consider like the, the space between the buildings and how to make that open and accessible and uh, actually make people wanting to go there and feeling that they that they uh, have the right to to access that area um, just as much as the people living there and I think that's uh, something that we are pretty good at in the Nordic region but uh, could be even better I guess and I just have to comment on that sorry <laughs> but like uh, yeah like walkability came to my mind when you talked about that like mm being able to encounter people and having spaces for encountering. But then, like, my father is from Nigeria, and I, I think this is a very Nordic way of thinking how to create communality or, like, mm. this kind of... Uh, my father is from Nigeria, and we visited Nigeria 2015, and I was just reading Jan Gehl's book about mm. uh, how to build good uh, public spaces, and nothing, like, worked on that context. <laughs> people were hanging out on motorways, uh, you know, using the space totally different in a different way, and like there was a strong sense of community. Mm. Like I, I don't know, like I don't know what they do there. <laughs> there were, like it was very different. And in Finland, people barely say hi to each other, even mm. though you can, you know, <laughs> probably the, the same in Norway and <laughs> Denmark. So maybe it's also something we should understand more, like, and mm. do more, like, lo on, on a local level. But I think, I mean, again, about creating those places to meet, even though it could be a, <laughs> a highway. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that's very important because uh, the more we actually meet each other and interact with each other, the more we will also understand each other uh, and the more, well, it will get easier to, to build that sense of mm -hmm. belonging and, and community. Um, building so um, so I think uh, I think those meeting places in of all kinds of variations uh, is very important Carmen did you have anything you wanted uh, to add to I think it was answered very well um, <laughs> unfortunately there was that one question because <laughs> we're now kind of at time uh, for a short break uh, of 15 minutes but please do interact between each other, because that is the whole point of these <laughs> meetings as well. Uh, and we will have the second panel, which you've laid out a lot of the challenges. So I'm really good. I'm really glad that we get a second chance at solving some of them after. So thank you very much. Uh, and we can thank you. Very much. And we will be back in 15 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone in physical world and outside. Um, to the second panel, I think we, I, I very much enjoy kind of the, the dynamic that's come through from Massimo's uh, keynote and then this, who set the stage perfectly. We brought in a lot of different uh, topics and challenges of what this new Bauhaus movement can say uh, and in the Nordics and what the Nordics can say about it. I kind of wanted this panel to be about the solutions, the drivers, the challenges maybe, and what kind of things we could uh, put. And the topic was brought up that uh, a multidisciplinary approach would be beneficial. That's why I'm thrilled that on the panel uh, we have an architect, uh, Oscar Norelius from Sweden. We have a designer, uh, Taivi Takokalio from Finland, and a civil engineer. Um, you saw Kokkonen from Finland as well. Um, so my first question would be, and please kind of maybe introduce yourself a bit more than this to say like where are you coming from on this perspective, but what for you, and we'll have a bit of time to go into different directions, but what for you is the kind of driver or positive aspect that you have in this movement building of a new of the new Bauhaus movement of making things more sustainable, making it together, the aesthetics that you see in the Nordics. Like, what is maybe the the strength that you can see there, if if any? I'm hoping one, and if not, let's go to the challenges straight ahead. Let's you start, Oscar. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, my name is Oscar Norlis. As you said, I'm an architect and a partner at White. So where I'm coming from to this discussion is uh, is a practice that's uh, research driven. Uh, and it's an interdisciplinary practice, uh, working on all scales of urban design down to object design, but through architecture and public spaces. Um, so what I really see as a key issue to the new European Bauhaus that I think we can enable in the Nordics is, is actually bringing research and practice together. It was mentioned in the previous panel as well, but I think that there's a big key to addressing these issues very fast, uh, to, to actually be able to connect those two. Uh, to put the findings that we have in research into practice, into actual projects. And I think that will be very important in the European Bauhaus as well, in the together aspect of actually showcasing what this will mean. Something that's very practical. I think we're hearing very interesting theoretical discussions now, um, which really are necessary um, to understand where we're going and kind of shifting the targets uh, further ahead all the time, but also making sure that we do implement it and show what it means when you're working on the holistic uh, aspect of all the three legs of the Bauhaus. Yeah. Great. Ivy. Um, yeah, well, maybe I'll start with the Arctic. I live in the Arctic. So I live 400 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle in Finland. And uh, for quite a long time already, it's been very obvious living there. It, we see it in our everyday life that climate change is doing its trick. And we, we know that it's necessary to do something about it. So that's, that's not news for anyone who lives in the Arctic region. Um, and obviously the Nordic approach for, for me, because I've been involved with the, the Nordic, uh, the new European Bauhaus initiative from early days in my role, my former role as the president of the Bureau of European Design Associations, we had a, a very um, dense uh, interaction with, with the Bauhaus team in the commission. We, we realized that, that um, it stems out of necessity, but also it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity perhaps for, for the creative fields, for art, architecture, design, to now have a position where we can have, where these fields can have an impact. But the impact will not happen alone. It will happen in a dialogue with other disciplines. And this is something perhaps which is some, something we know from the Nordics. Um, for me, at least, being a Finn, the interaction between disciplines in Finland, that has been there for a long time. And the, the basics for the new European Bauhaus to, to sort of move on benefits from democracy and, and the, 
the, the sort of the core of the Nordic societies lies in democracy. So many of the basic things we talk about when we talk about the new European Bauhaus initiative, they are based on a democratic approach. Mm -hmm. So that would be sort of my answer to you. Uh, excellent question. answer. Yusso, <clears throat> thank you. Please. So I'm Yusso Kokkonen. I work at Karelia University of Applied Sciences. Uh, I work in a pro project that roughly translates to constructions, greener transition. So uh, for me, the biggest driver is that as an engineer, I find that uh, Nordic construction is already very high quality uh, among many things, physical features, chemical features, looks, beauty, su such things. But there is so much work to be done. When I look, uh, I do mainly uh, this LCA calculations, uh, calculation of the building a uh, carbon footprint, and I see that there's so much potential to be done. The carbon values are like 17 kilograms or 20 kilograms per square meter, and yesterday I was hear hearing from an architect that they could reduce the carbon footprint to like less than five. So I think there's lots of work to be done, and that's really interesting to me. In, in the junction between architecture and civil engineering, and engineering, basically, yes, uh, solutions. And they, they, they combine greatly. Great. I mean, I'm hearing that, you know, Nordics are ahead on quite a lot of things, so, like, <laughs> any challenges? I think there's all, always a challenge. You know, uh, we hear a lot this sort of talk and, and discussion that the Nordics are leading in this field and that field, and we Finns are leading, you know, happiness and everything. But, uh, I, and, and that's, that's, of course, you, well, you, you can say that, that that's not perhaps true, but what I think is, is You made essential. everyone laugh, I think, that, you know. Yeah, the, well, yeah, but... The facto proof. But. I'm a happy person. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of happy persons in, in, in Finland, definitely. But uh, I think the key is that, that no country, no nation, no culture is ready and completed. Democracies or, or our social welfare models, they, they work when they work, but when the world changes, they have to change as well. So the interpretation of what, where we are good at, that varies a long time. So the challenges are there always and all the time. We can always improve. Yeah, and I, I think there are a huge amount of challenges, obviously, in the Nordics as well. But one thing that I've come across and working a lot on projects outside of the Nordics as well, based in Stockholm, but working with kind of our mindset, is that the projects that we realize outside of the Nordics are sometimes or quite often better than the ones that we do in the Nordics because we kind of collide our way of working and our kind of ideas and ideals and knowledge with other ways of doing things. So I think that the idea of togetherness and, and sharing experiences is very important and that not one region or country has, one solu has the one solution but as we kind of collide these different ways of doing, that's when we open the doors to actually creating something new that is one step closer to this moving target mm. that we're finding. Can I, can I ask? Mm. Uh, you say they are often better. In what way? How do you sort of Great. see the... That was my the, question as well. What is the better? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's, yeah, it's maybe it's, it's a bit... Uh, the formulation might have been a bit sloppy, but I think it becomes more interesting. It's actually getting us further ahead than we would have done. If you're doing one project in Sweden, basically, and doing the second project in Sweden, we get a bit further than that. But when we take that knowledge and realize a project somewhere else, I think we get further ahead so on sustainability, kind of on kind of attractivity, on, on all of this. Yeah, I think that there's a, a potential in, we're talking a lot about disruption now, kind of leaving the experience behind somehow and kind of leaping forward faster. And I think that that kind of leap can be greater when you lose the context that you generated the knowledge in and go into somewhere else. Right. And I imagine that comes also with friction, which was mentioned in the previous, uh, as actually called for <laughs> in the previous panel. But, and that friction is beneficial, uh, but can be quite challenging. How, how do you go about, and I mean, it is a core part of design, um, but is the gains that you're calling for uh, 
mixing engineering and architecture. So I mean, like, it seems to be a common theme, but it's a it is a difficult process <clears throat> at times. Or you all seem quite confident that it's not. So I'm, I'm very no, it's it's difficult, but I think that we are really good at avoiding friction in the Nordics with the consensus-driven approach that we have, um, which is quite difficult to uh, implement in other cultures or frameworks, but uh, super efficient. But so I was specifically, when you confront or co collaborate uh, with other cultures, how does that work? Like I'm, I'm trying to think outside of the Nordics. I, I, I definitely recognize uh, an amazing ability for consensus making, uh, but does that, or, or does that translate very well? that ability in other cultures when you're, when you're working with them? Yeah, well, I think for me, it's, it's different to different projects. Okay. When it works well, it translates well. And, like when it translates well, that's when it works well. Right. And okay. I think that the first kind of, if, if we're very practical, the first kind of approach that we have is the question from the clients and the collaborators in another culture saying, but who is leading this ship? Uh, because we don't have that same cult of having one person who's talking really mm -hmm. loudly and deciding everything. It's more of this making sure that everyone gets heard pushing the, the projects forward in that way. Um, and sometimes it doesn't really add up. They actually expect someone to take a greater le leadership uh, in, the, in their conventional way. But when we can work in that collaborative manner that we have, I think, and that we're really good at in the Nordics, we, um, we, we can get, get, get away from some of the issues um, that were inherent in the, in the processes locally uh, and come a step further. And then we learn as well, of course, uh, from the ways of doing there. And, uh so, so much work is done at the same time, the same work, we need to cooperate more. I, I find the construction sector to be one of the more conservative sectors. <laughs> so we need I to think there's recognition of that sense. Yeah, yeah. We, I feel a certain recognition. Yes, please go on. We need to get everyone on the board. It, it's not working if we have only the consults and... Uh, architects and such on board. We need every person of the whole chain. And uh, I graduated recently uh, as a civil engineer. So I'm kind of representing a new generation of engineers. And uh, the whole construction education mainly focuses around building new buildings, producing these new buildings efficiently as possible, to be <laughs> cheap as possible, but to serve their pu purpose. Uh, I mean, have our demands become too high? Uh, I lived in the highest uh, timber uh, block of flats in the whole Europe, the 14-story Joensuu lighthouse for a couple of years. And uh, as we look at the demands for acoustics, for example, the, barely, the building very barely meets the criteria for acoustics, even though there was research done about the acoustic features. And all the people living in that house saying, were saying that the living conditions are excellent. So, and if we look at other materials, uh, concrete, for example, there would, wouldn't be need for to make 220 millimeters thick concrete slabs for load bearing purposes. 150 millimeters would be enough, but we're increasing this material thicknesses so that it meets the very high demands. So maybe we should be more material efficient and look at the, those things again. Where is the, I mean, I can't imagine the, I'm, I, I think that's an interesting point. Like, but how are these criteria kind of, in a way, going up? Because I would imagine that all the drivers are to reduce materials, not necessarily for sustainable reasons, but also just for the sake of price. Yeah, uh, great things are happening right now. Uh, uh, let's say most of products need uh, CE markings to be uh, able to use in a construction product. And if we look at the circularity aspects, now, it's not possible to get a CE marking for a product that you cannot prove that it's been fully remanufactured. So those things are being looked at and improved. So uh, 
But I think, so is your point that the, the actual value chains as well need to be kind of rethought from, and not only kind of within the silos of each one of the construction sector? Uh, is that what I'm hearing? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And that, yes, well, okay, big nod from Pivy, so <laughs> I'm guessing, like, okay. Well, I just want, not, not continuing on that, that line, but, but going a b bit back to what was said earlier, uh, how easy it is to collaborate or uh, between cultures, for yes. example. Okay. I don't think it, it's, it, uh, it's at all easy. I think it's, it's very challenging. And I think there's also a sort of a, we seem to think that Nordic countries think alike and and there's very little variation between nordic countries and this is how it looks if you look at f enough far far enough away Wait, yeah. but when when you go into the nordic countries I, I i have to say as a finn that i think there's a huge difference between finnish swedish danish and norwegian culture so i think everything is relative in this sense as well uh, but f to be able to collaborate uh, you really need some time to make that work and you need to have the motivation and willingness to do it and perhaps generally speaking we are at a phase in the world globally speaking as well where we see all the huge challenges we face and we slowly we have started to realize that we simply can't solve these challenges unless we collaborate and unless we we have a Th uh, smooth enough dialogue between disciplines as well, but no one says it's easy, and I don't think it will be easy with the new European Bauhaus initiative either. There, there are sort of things that have started to happen, and change has started to happen definitely, but I think we have a long way to go still before we have a really fluent discussion between the, the uh, disciplines. You might have another uh, experience, um, but me, but do, can you can you think that that the you're sort of that you said that you can even take a leap uh, when you work with other cultures? Do, do you think it could be possible because it's still quite a limited number of disciplines you work with alikes or don't or don't you? How, how do you see that? No, I maybe it was misinterpreted a bit. I'm not saying that it's easy. Mm. And by saying talking about the consensus in the Nordics, it doesn't mean that we all think the same. Mm. It's just think that like that's. I would say the consensus form, can be built. Yeah, it's, it's, and that's the form for us to drive projects ahead rather than friction and, and con uh, conflict. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a great challenge in it, but I think that the challenge is also what generates the solutions. Um, so we really need to put a lot of effort into it. And uh, talking about collaboration and the need for collaboration, I think is really important at this level of the European Bauhaus, but it also comes down to very concrete and basic things. Uh, contracts were discussed yesterday, the division of responsibility, how to make sure that a whole group has a joint responsibility is, um, especially when the, the, the responsibility that we're talking about is huge. Mm. Uh, the impacts are very big for architecture and urban design yeah. um, and design as well on people. Uh, but it's also the tools uh, that we work in, the, the companies that we're organized in. So there's a lot of things that need to be reviewed. And we've discussed the, I think it came up at some point yesterday as well, the, the corporations that now have uh, a sense of purpose or actually write in a purpose in there, uh, aside from making money, which is, I think, a great way of developing this. But we can also use existing companies, but building collaborations where you divide this responsibility and kind of form this uh, group together. And sometimes when, when uh, the projects that I've been in internationally, um, you're also given a role. And then there's an expect expectation and responsibility, and with re responsibility comes mandates. So sometimes when we're as a Swedish architect or Scandinavian or Nordic architect abroad, there's an expectation of what we will bring to the table. And with that expectation comes a possibility as well. And then, of course, it's, it's easier if everyone thinks alike. But, uh, but yeah, being an interdisciplinary practice, we've made sure that we have lots of different disciplines in-house. We have social anthropologists, we have architects, engineers, we have biologists. So we've made sure that we're actually never in our comfort zone, working only with the likes. And that, I think, makes it easier as well, going beyond the borders of our company. You bring up many interesting points, but one that I'm particularly interested in, uh, about the shared responsibility and ownership. The, <laughs> the implication of it is that somebody has to lose power the person that had the responsibility beforehand or that is expected to. Is that something that, that usually doesn't come without friction either? Uh, how is your experience in that? Because I, I 
you know, we heard, we all have to take part in this. Uh, it's, and I agree with all those statements, but the actually take part and genuinely take part requires people to feel a certain level of ownership, of responsibility, and to be, to actually be accountable for it, which means that they really have the power to do or not to do something. How do you give away that power in a way that is, you know, comfortable or, so, or maybe that comfort doesn't have to come into it, but I don't know, yeah, like, I mean, yes, and this is, uh, yeah, each time well, this is for all three of you. For me, for me uh, a key answer is trust. Uh, it's, it's, it becomes easier to give away some of your power if there's a strong level of trust. And either you, either you develop trust, you, you, you manage to create trust in time, and of course trust is something which always takes time, but I would say that, that perhaps this is, this is possible and maybe more possible in the Nordics, in the Nordic countries than in some other countries, because we have a very strong level of trust mm, in culture. our societies. So I would, I would sort of imagine at least that this is a prerequisite for um, equal processes, process, processes with a strong equality, strong participation from different types of, of disciplines or roles. Uh, and then the issue of, of power is not as big, you, mm -hmm. you, as you accept more easily the shared responsibility. Um, that would be my sort of question, uh, thinking on, on this, definitely. Sure. You, um, I think rising awareness is key point to this also. When we can bring everybody on the board to look at what are the goals, what are the risks if we don't act, so maybe then people can uh, ease up and cooperate better. Yeah, shared understanding of the... Like, yes, the, what are the drivers and goals behind it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also, I think we agree where the power belongs, right? Um, With the know. people, oh. somehow, yeah, oh. I think, basically in the Nordics. And, and it's, it's an issue maybe of someone losing power, but it's, it's more an issue of taking that power back putting it to the collectivities, um, whether it be municipality or a state or a, um, uh, a community um, that needs to kind of take that power back and then redistribute it into a, a new shape that can actually really build on those, uh, on the needs of the, of the collective. And, and because you mentioned the importance of practicality as well as theory, so uh, like from your own experience, but same for the two of you, you said, you know, you had expectations as a Swedish artifact when you came, when you go abroad, uh, probably with all the kind of, you know, biases that come with it, uh, probably mostly positive, but there's still biases. Um, that, conf that gives you also a certain level of power. How do you go about sharing that in a context that is in a way not your own? And so where maybe that trust is, well, needs to be built at the very least, or, or is maybe more distant. Or is that not an issue? You come up with the trust initially. How, how do you go about that? And same thing for your own experiences, of course. I'm, you know. yeah, I, I think for me, it's the, what, what's kind of the core of my practice, or our practice right now, mm -hmm. is one project that we just realized in the north of Sweden, which is a timber tower that's 20 stories mm -hmm. tall, mass timber, uh, a culture center that's part of an urban revitalization um, plan, which is, has been a very good example of kind of driving um, our, our um, practice ahead. Uh, and what, what we try to do when we get into these new situations is always, we're not bringing the solutions from that project into a new project. Uh, it's, it's rather coming with a set of a, a process, a mindset, a way of involving everyone and kind of using the, the power as you, you name it or maybe the expectations um, to build that sort of environment where we can generate something new together. So that not to keep it, but to distribute it to, to everyone in the in the group. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's kind of the key to working with innovation, re regardless of if it's technological or social or economic, is that you, you need to make sure that no one brings a ready-made solution to the table, because then it's not innovation. You need to create kind of a setting where the, the, the whole of the participants can generate something that's new. Uh, and that's kind of the way that we work uh, and the, the way we try to handle that issue that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you saw you brought up the fact that you represent in a way a new generation. Thank 
thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, so. uh, do you feel, I, I've been meaning to ask this question actually from Massimo from the first panel, so I have an opportunity now, and you know, for you too as well, but do you feel there's a, there's a change in that level of responsibility generationally or that, uh, that interdisciplinary action, or has it been there all along and it's, it's just the nature of the, those fields in a way? Like a yeah, I think so. And there's also much room for new possibilities and shared responsibility. When you talk about, let's say, circularity, uh, whose job is it to, uh, now that the demolition contractor uh, crushes the building up and uh, recycles those parts, uh, they don't have the time or the uh, storage to manage those parts. So we need new, uh, new operators that can uh, come there, process the part and sell it, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's new business to be made. Mm. There's new actors doing the, in this kind of revamped value chain. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah very much so. I, I, actually, on that point, like the multidisciplinary uh, uh, aspect has been called for by the previous panel and by you as well. Um, those new responsibilities, those new, in a way, jobs. How how do you how do you see maybe the achievement of building them up? Because there's a question of speed here as well involved, and how how fast we can create them. I don't know how fast we can create them, but but um, definitely it's a process. If if I'm thinking about the the design community or the design design profession, uh, it was. Um, a few decades ago, how, how the profession of industrial designer was defined. It mm -hmm. was defined that the, the, the designer is the representative of the end user. So, which meant that end users were not involved. It, there was no need to involve end users. Uh, now the, the situation is completely different. For a long time already in design profession and design professionals, what they have been discussing is that you have to involve users, you have to involve end users. But this is not only with, with uh, design profession, this is a societal mm -hmm. issue. If you think about processes, how policies are made, how, how whatever in, in societies actually is made now, is there's a requirement that you do it as uh, a co-design process, like we like to say from the design communities, or it's a participatory process. So, but that I think, oh, I believe that only follows the change in the society. It becomes a need, it becomes a necessity. And then from the necessity, there's a demand, if we want to use that word, and then slowly, the, the professions and the, the um, processes in society come along adjust. with that and adjust to yeah. that. What will happen next? That will be very interesting to see. That, that will that sort of curve turn at some point? Because nothing is forever. So, and I wouldn't, would not have an answer to that. But at the moment, definitely, <laughs> we are living, living a sort of a phase where we value doing together. And this, of course, is, is the, the whole core of, of the new European Bauhaus initiative, that you need to do it together. There's a strong belief in that. And then when that starts to happen, it supports the belief as well. And I, I, I love the fact that you see the, that need and that kind of trend, at least, that is so strong. I'm, I'm not so sure it's, it's a global phenomenon. There is a definitely a kind of other approach, a much more top-down approach to achieve the goals we would, and the you know, need we would have to achieve kind of sustainability markers. And, and there's a lot of aspects of that trend that are strong as well. Do you, do you see that tension as a positive, like an alternative models and, and the benefit from having those two approaches or a risk that we are kind of maybe giving away some of the democratic values that were so eloquently described here? Well, if, if 
I sort of quickly react to that. I'm, I'm, it's probably very clear that I'm a really strong believer in democracies. Um, but... Um, Hence the question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but democracy is... Um, it's not the only model. And I think in, in the big picture, perhaps it's actually good that, that uh, the whole world is not based on democracies. Because it's, it's the same as the question of beautiful and ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you are, it's easier for you to recognize the beautiful if you know ugly as well. So maybe it's the same with societal systems as well. But um, I still think that, that um, there's value in... Um, trying to ensure that democracies develop. But I, I'm, I would not be one to say that, that the whole world mm -hmm. should be democratic. I don't think that's even possible. You always need a counter, counter force in a way. So I don't know what, what that sort of, how that will, will develop, but a, a sort of a short answer. Great, on such a large topic, thank you. Um, I'm looking at the time and uh, we will have time for a Q&A. So actually, if you start thinking and people out there as well about any questions you would like to ask from any of our panelists and also uh, we will be calling back Massimo to join uh, in the final part of the Q&A. But just maybe one last question to kind of all three of you. Um, I feel there's a quite of optimistic tone uh, in all three of you on, on getting these challenges, which are sizable, not easy, but actually done. Am, am, am I right in hearing this, or, or, or is it deceptively, you know, uh, the case? Like, do you, do you think there's, there's genuinely kind of a real chance of getting this? How feasible is this change that, you're, that we're all talking about? I, 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 yeah, I have to agree. I'm still in shock by what you said ah. about democracy, actually. <laughs> Good. Uh, so I'm trying I'm to, to, uh, to Brilliant. Kind of focus on to the next one. Uh, yeah, optimism, absolutely. We can get um, back to the democracy question the, at the Q&A. Yeah, good. Uh, I think the, the, um, it, it's very difficult. I think we need to, to, to understand that we're making a shift from going towards one goal that we need to obtain. And that's not what the optimism is about because okay. the target is changing the whole time. We need to push that and we need to still kind of do these small steps within the reality that we're in now to get to, towards that. And I think that in that journey, there is a lot of optimism and a lot of positive energy. Um, but uh, to understand the issues that we're facing today as a kind of a fixed challenge that we might reach or not, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that's correct. Um, so it's not that kind of, yes, we can do it, but uh, we're going to do something and it's going to move in the right direction. And in, and in that, there's a lot of optimism. And I think that's required for us to move ahead. Great. You said it very well, I think, because uh, it's, it's absolutely, as you say, that it's not a fixed target. It, it changes, varies with time. The reason for me to be optimistic is uh, uh, I have three children, three sons, 30 plus and minus, and them and, and their generation, they think about... Um, climate change and sustainability or regeneration very differently from ours. They do it in their everyday life as well. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that they, whatever happens, however the, the, the target changes and whatever changes we, we have to face, they will be able to solve, solve them. In the long history of the world, this has always been the case. And I, I really believe that this will be the case now as well. Uh, yeah, the, uh, maybe... You don't have to agree. Please disagree. <laughs> no, no. Well, I'm thinking about the pricing situation which has been uh, happening recently. Sure. Prices have uh, rocketed due to increasing in demand and uh, supply shortage, I guess. So maybe this is a good chance for us to think of this one-time use culture with low service lives, and maybe look back at the past. Uh, in the Nordics, uh, people were living for generations in the same log cabin built with the locally sourced materials, uh, which, which was really nice. So we need this, these successful pilot buildings, which kind of see that this is possible, 
and everyone can do it, and we will do it together. Well, that's optimism if I have ever heard it. So, um, thank you very much to all three. I, I think we can give them a round of applause. Um, would uh, the former panelists and Massimo please join? And if anyone has questions in the audience and also uh, digitally, I will be asking of help, uh, technical help, to see if any of you have questions. But are there any questions for any of the panelists? I think we've covered kind of democracy, the future of the world, like sustainability, like you have a pick. Please, come. Yes, please. And, and could you please introduce yourself as well, just to you? <laughs> Designers as well. <laughs> Can happen. Uh, and I, I think at least in one, we need a lot of growth so that we have to follow the rules. And that has to be followed the rules of the EU because we are, we are a bit obliged because we are the Brussels. Of the <laughs> Just next door. <laughs> So is it, is and I think this collaboration also that's and working together that's not working so well. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a, a good segue back to the question of uh, democracy and collaboration. Not, but this is the, a very, I mean, this is organized by the Nordics and a very Nordic panel, but, and, and we wanted to be Southern Europe. Yeah, sure. France and Belgium. Uh, and uh, it's not possible to make a one fits for all guideline that fits the whole Europe because Nordics are such a different environment than uh, Central or South Europe. Uh, in Belgium, the people density is like three to four hundred per square kilometer. In Finland, is it like 18, so we have so much room, <laughs> so, so much more That's room, yeah, so perhaps making skyscrapers isn't the best option for Nordics. If I may continue from that, uh, I live in Lapland in Finland and the density of population is between 0 0.1 to 1 person per square kilometer. So we live in a very different reality. But if I understood you correctly about uh, legislation, that you would be in favor of legislation. And, and I, I agree, we need regulation. But perhaps the fact with regulation and legislation is that you can never reach the top quality only through legislation or regulation. So e even if we had the best possible legislation in Europe, let's say European-wide legislation, that would not be a guarantee uh, to quality of life or, or to um, top quality solutions. So we always need something beyond legislation as well. But definitely sort of the basic level I think there are, uh, with my experience being part of the European design community um, and working for the policy level, there are great 
achievements in every single country in Europe. But perhaps the difference between, it can be a difference, I'm not even sure that this, this is true, but perhaps there's a difference between the general level, so because the Nordics are applauded um, based on the general level of what we have achieved. And that might be, in some aspects of life, it might be higher than in some other countries. But um, it's, it's also quite a challenge to measure the level. So I, I would say, I definitely would say that there are great achievements in, in su southern European countries as well. But perhaps there are also flaws that are more visible. And we certainly, in Nordic countries, we have our flaws as well. So I think it's a continuous process, more than anything else. Oscar, I yeah. saw you wanting to add something. Yeah, and I think regarding the process and how things are done in different parts of Europe, um, I think that when we're talking about collaboration and distribution of responsibility, um, there's space and necessity for leadership even though we're working in a collaborative manner. So there's still need for someone or, or some parties uh, to collectively kind of bring this forward. Um, and it's not an issue of, of, of democracy doesn't mean anarchy, right? And I think that's an important issue when we're trying to merge our different cultures into working together. Not to uh, target on biases, but there are two members of Southern Europe <laughs> as well uh, on the panel. So uh, do you have anything to add? You don't, don't feel that you have to. Um, I think um, that people should demand uh, the changes and politicians um, regulate what they feel people demand. So as she pointed out, sorry, I don't remember. Baidi. Yeah. Um, people uh, have an important role and have to demand these changes. Uh, everywhere, and we have a global problem, many global problems, and United Nations uh, has the role of helping uh, to um, make people be aware of these problems and to demand the different changes that we need. Does well, it make sense? I well, know, oh, I'm just nodding like okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything to add? You good? Does anyone else have a question, or maybe, uh, yes? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, please, please, please. So the question is, are architects obligated today to understand, or do they have to understand the technical, the technicalities of the construction sector? Mm. To be, to the architects and non-architects on our panel. Mm. Oh, and yes, and so and yes, okay. The question of also within the education of architects uh, is this part? Should this be part of the training or? How does it affect that training? Maybe Massimo, do you have, I mean, so I'm looking training, at you, but. Uh, so you, are, you, you want to connect now the construction industry and education? Is, is this what you are trying to? Uh... Mm. Whether it should or not. What, what I mean, in, in reality, it is a collaborative work. Uh, uh, if, if we are talking now specifically about building something, uh, it, it involves many, many people who are designers and known. Uh, it, it involves uh, uh, also uh, communities most of the times. I mean, there are uh, building regulations, there are regulations that comes from fire department. Uh, we never really say it, but the fire department in Iceland has a, a really big uh, uh, big word in, in the way your project is, is uh, fi finalized. Uh, but I'm also thinking that we, we, on one hand, we tend to regulate the materials and the sustainability of the materials. Um, on the other hand, it's also really difficult to uh, if we only focus on the material and not on the 
on the system of this material. So I, I, I have to give you an example. Like in Iceland, there was, we have regulations concerning the sustainability of certain materials. And, and then there was a recent competition that the architect wanted to use the local material, the material that was actually found by excavating the building site. So I think if this were, was maybe 100 years ago, it would have been perfect. So you, you make the foundation, you find exactly the right material that you want, and you want to use it. Well, in Iceland, it was impossible. Because no matter how you calculated the cost, it was actually cheaper to buy this stone from China, but not from Iceland. Because the cost to, to, of labor to work that, that stone made it not affordable. So uh, 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 we also have to face these contradictions today that uh, the, uh, the globalization of economy also creates not competitive, uh, uh, sustainable solution because we tend to look at the price. And then we tend to look at the price of the material shipped to Iceland, but we don't tend to understand the context of how this material is, uh, is then shipped to Iceland and, and how it is made in another country. So uh, uh, it's an immensely complex uh, issue, the one of, of materials that it not only involves architecture, I think fashion is, is extremely exposed now to, to this, uh, who makes your, your shirt and, and, you know, so, it, it, but I think it's very much about how the system of production that we have built in, in this century, that involves everything, not only architecture. I'm going to try to get through two, three questions, so I might not give everyone an opportunity to speak, but there was another question, I think. Yeah, I was just I'm interested in tailoring, but I just feel like the concept of a more, of the Nordic uh, consensus is a fallacy. It's built on an idea, like, the, like an idea of a perceived hegemony or homogeneity, which doesn't actually exist. We have this idea of what a Nordic person is, and everyone who is outside of that norm is not really taken into account. According to studies, Finland is one of the most racist countries in the EU. The Nordic countries across the board have the most violent laws against trans people, and so on and so forth. So if you, if you need to pretend that everybody has the same values, if you systematically ignore people who don't have the same values. So I think, um, the, well, I wonder if, if it's because, <laughs> if the concept of consensus is not translatable to other countries, because other countries have, have larger and more visible Sure. Well, it's going to be a challenge for me to uh, <laughs> reword that for the people out there. You missed a great uh, point, uh, but I'm not going to do it justice. But maybe the question that I can hear there is, is the consensus uh, or the Nordic consensus a fallacy uh, and struggling or in a way erasing the differences that those cultures do have, but maybe do not recognize in such way. So simplify the issue that maybe is more complex in other places. Am I, yes? Okay. <laughs> Who wants to take this light and easy topic? But I, I can jump in, sorry. Uh, no, no, uh, I also have something to say. But yeah, please. yeah. Okay, just, just I think that um, when we are describing our way of working with consensus, um, and when I'm talking about it at least, uh, it doesn't mean that everyone thinks the same and that everyone needs to think the same, and that the goal at the end of the process is that everyone agrees on everything. It's more of saying that uh, people have a different set of, of ideals and values and thoughts and backgrounds and cultures. And one way of kind of moving ahead together is to find the things that you agree on, finding that common base. Uh, the other way is finding the things that you don't agree on and then kind of going from that to see what you actually can agree on. And I think in the end, it's, it's two different approaches, two different ways of doing, but the goal is not that everyone thinks the same. Uh, and that's not what the consensus, uh, what I mean by consensus when I'm talking about our way of working. It's more of, of, of a process uh, that is not based on conflict and, um, uh, and friction, which doesn't mean it's better than any other way of doing it, but uh, it's, it's our way of doing it, maybe, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, well, thank you for the, for the question, really. Uh, uh, I think the world of university today, whether it's in Scandinavia or, or in the Baltics or... Uh, 
North America is there is this buzzword that is the one of decolonizing our uh, our education, and I think there is an awareness of uh, that the map of the world that we have been seeing uh, all our lives is actually totally biased. That Germany was made bigger, that it was made at the center of the map, and you know these biases are incredibly present in our knowledge. So the project and the process of decolonizing is about revealing these biases, trying to be more inclusive in not only what is taught, but also by whom. Uh, and I, at least I, I can feel that the decolonizing move, movement at university it is about, uh, it's fundamentally about pluralism, it's about uh, revealing those voices that have been hidden uh, for, uh, for a long time, whether those voices come from uh, missing educators or uh, missing uh, representatives, but I, at least I perceive a, an intention and an interest in, uh, in listening what can be said as the other. Uh, that is, for me, I, I feel it much more present today than 10 years ago. Mm. And, uh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and I, I feel like uh, definitely there's been this kind of like, uh, how, how, how would word did you use? Like, uh, not homogeneous. Fallacy hegemonic like people think or maybe there was the thought that everyone thinks the same but i i think we are in some kind of also breaking point where we have like now i'm talking about the finnish context but i guess what i've followed sweden as well like there was huge polarization segregation and these kind of things happening uh, after corona like the cities maybe like in finland at least like people are moving out from the cities, or that's like the tendency. So I, I feel there is becoming more and more like plural, like ways of thinking, and it's forcing us planners, designers, and architects also do things differently. And I think participation is one way, uh, maybe to kind of like not not fight that, but like try try to kind of like you know give a response uh, to this like crumbling of this one way of doing doing things. I certainly hope so, that, that we are sort of moving forward uh, as well. And w what I would like to say again is, is uh, the issue of trust to a certain degree, not to a full degree, obviously, but to a certain degree, I would say that in Finland, because we were talking about, or you were talking about Finland as well, uh, to a certain degree that these issues come up and that they are discussed and they are sort of open um, in, in, in the dialogues um, requires trust. If, if, you have, if you have a society where, where there's no trust at all, or which are not, let's say, democratic, as we, we've been talking about democracy a lot, then um, talking about the issues would not be as easy, or it possibly could not be possible at least, at, uh, at all. So I, I have a hope, in, my hope lies uh, in open dialogues about the issues and then the solutions, what can we achieve? That's a different question. But if you don't have the dialogue, then you can't reach the solution. So I'm, I'm hopeful in that sense. So my trust in the state in Finland is not the same as for example my white mother's because I don't trust that the state cares about whether or not mm. I will die. <laughs> Again, <laughs> very good question and comment. Challenging to um, is there, is there a question or like I mean the comment in itself no, is no, yeah. It falls. The problem mm. I think this trust is fairly much more unique and very easy. I think that it's, if you're in Belgium too, you can trust. Mm. You say yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
on that note, maybe, <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's a good, in a way, moment to stop the conversation. We've kind of, the point was to look at the new European Bauhaus movement and its effect and how the Nordics and, and it was called by the uh, different panelists to say, we need to be confronted. We need to have interactions uh, beyond uh, the disciplines, beyond the borders of our countries, which obviously happens. I'm not, you know, it's not necessarily a new thing, just that there needs more of it. That's what I heard. And thank you very much, actually, to um, both of you and everyone who asked questions to actually kind of enable that to happen here as well. Uh, I'd like to, um, and please, could we thank again all our panelists? And thank you so much. It was, it was really interesting. Um, I would like to give the opportunity to, for the closing words, uh, for Mina Karkonen to come at the, uh, from the Ministry of uh, Education and Culture in Finland to give the final words for uh, this whole session. But thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you again to the panel. Uh, so, dear participants, it's time to thank you. What a morning and what an ending to this morning. It has been wonderful and inspiring. Uh, together we have discussed what the new European Bauhaus could mean in the Nordic countries and how we in the North can take on its values and really kind of discuss the values. What a Nordic construction culture would mean how we could move towards such a culture and whether an interpretation of this culture could support a sustainability and, and circular economy, but also an inclusive, participatory, transparent processes. Uh, as we know, boundaries in the field of culture and, and, and in the field of cultures are often fluid and in constant movement. Uh, breach in architecture and, and construction and other disciplines and collaborating over sectors and country lines uh, can lead to new and, and innovative approaches and to sustainable living environments and, and reimagining. I'm really, really happy that we've been able to take this morning in the, this context of the new European Bauhaus and consider its possibilities uh, in the European Union and hopefully also beyond. <laughs> because this is a sandbox, also, although a large one, but it is a sandbox. And, and we in the Nordic countries, we do have something to give, sometimes quite a lot to give. We have a lot to benefit from, from this cooperation. And I really, really hope that this cooperation will not be uh, only with like-minded people, with our friends, with our you know, kind of dearest colleagues. Because this kind of consensus is something that I have to admit, working at the government is our big mistake sometimes. We tend to listen in a way that we give time and space, but do we really listen? And that's why I think that this movement of new European Bauhaus is, is challenging for us, is needed. And I take it very seriously. I take it a little bit personally, which might be a good thing. Um, while culture is and cultures are everywhere, uh, pinpointing the exact points where its contribution can, can be strong enough is, is, is difficult. Uh, we should, in a way, clearly recognize in these processes in, in Euro European Bauhaus uh, how to communicate the potential of art and culture and cultures and diversity of cultures and, and cultural communities. So this event has shown, shown uh, at least that I have a very bad handwriting, I can't read it well, and, but there are, there are still room to broaden our horizon 
in the sectors of architecture and, and design, we can create new pathways uh, to integrate our strengths. We do have them, creativity, cultural awareness, and a human scale into construction. And there are some really interesting concepts, uh, for example, cosmopolitan citizenship that I would like to like, investigate and make a best use of them. So, the outcomes of, of, of this event will feed into the development of the narrative of, uh, of a Nordic construction culture. Uh, this work will be carried out by the Nordic networks of circular construction projects. Uh, and this development of, of, of this narrative will continue later this year. Uh, we will use research and, and draw upon uh, the concept of, of Paugultur. For updates on, on progress, you can follow the project's website at nordiccircularconstruction.com and we will also send you a, 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 a short feedback survey and I really hope that you could, could take the time to, to answer it. Uh, so, now it's time to close the session. Uh, luckily the festivities will continue just around the corner. So thank you for our brilliant, amazing and, and well, superb speakers, Massimo, uh, Santanici, Malinko, Hansen. Unfortunately, she's not here any longer, but really, Yuso Kokkonen, Oscar uh, Norelius, Efe Ogbeide, uh, Carmen Garcia, Sanchez, Päivitakko Kallio, and Vincent Evansant. I don't know, Lasalle. So, and thank you to our colleagues and partners there at the Finnish Cultural Institute for Benelux for all the amazing work you've done to make this happen. Thanks to each and every one of you here in Brussels and online uh, for participating. And let me end by wishing you all a happy festival weekend and all the best for the coming summer. Thank you. <laughs>